before I begin this episode, I'd like to issue a trigger warning. Not only are we going to talk about erotic comics intended for an adult audience, but this episode also happens to cover mental health and the most extreme form of self-harm. So, trigger warning, and with that said, let's begin the episode. Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Erotic comics have been around since the earliest days of comic book history. They've been around since before Superman. But they've also primarily been something that's been created by underground and indie publishers and comic creators. That is, until we get to the 1990s. Now, we've talked before in many episodes about the 1990s and how it had a huge speculator boom that drove comic sales way up. It meant lots of new comics. It meant lots of new comic book publishers. Well, today, we're going to talk about the rise and fall of one of those, and that was when the adult magazine Penthouse got into the comic book game. And ultimately, it's really about the tragic story of the main writer and editor behind those comics, a man named George Caragoni. While there are some examples of proto-comic books, the comic book as we recognize it today began in 1933 with famous funnies. But earlier than that, sometime in the 1920s, you could find eight-page comics that would illegally use popular newspaper comic strip characters like Tilly the Toiler for quick erotic stories. They came to be known as Tijuana Bibles because of the incorrect belief that they were being published across the border in Tijuana, Mexico, and that they were put in motel nightstands instead of a traditional Bible. They had their heyday during the Great Depression and disappeared around the 1960s as underground comics began emerging, like Robert Crumb's Fritz the Cat, for example. In 1962, Playboy magazine, which featured nude pictorials of ladies as well as journalism, began publishing a popular comic, Little Annie Fanny. It was a sexy, humorous series of two to seven page stories by Mad Magazine creators Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elder. In 1973, Penthouse Magazine, a competitor with Playboy, began their Oh Wicked Wanda comic strips by British creators Frederick Mullally and Ron Embleton as writer and artist, respectively. Switching away from men's magazines to comic books, the industry entered a speculator boom in 1990 that radically increased demand in comic books. Between 1990 and 1993, there were at least 24 comic book publishers flooding the market with their titles. Some of them, like Image Comics, are still around today. Many, like Chaos and Defiant, are long gone. An example of the latter is Penthouse Comics, which ran for 32 issues from 1994 through 1998. And while it may be easy to look down on comics like these, the fact was they paid some of the highest ever page rates to their artists said to be around $800 per page. Their initial sales were over 100,000 copies per issue, and by the time they shut down, they were still selling over 50,000 copies. But their overhead was very high, and the comics were canceled in 1998. I began looking at making an episode about the history of Penthouse Comics because of all the top-tier talent that was involved. Guys like Adam Hughes and Kevin Nolan. It was really impressive, but as I dug into the story, I realized that at its core, it really was the story of the writer and editor who made these comics, a man named George Caragoni, a man who wouldn't even live to see a full two years of the comic books that he was producing. George Caragoni was born in San Antonio, Texas in September of 1965, and according to his own bio from Penthouse Comics Issue 2, he got into comics after submitting an unsolicited pitch to Marvel in 1984, and got work at the company assisting the editor-in-chief, Jim Shooter. By late 1987, he got an opportunity to write comics, his dream. Caragoni was given opportunities to take over as the writer on some of Marvel's books when sales dwindled and the original writers left, including Masters of the Universe and Starbrand. By 1988, Jim Shooter had been let go from Marvel and started up Valiant Comics. 
Karagoni went to work on several of their earliest titles, like Captain N and Game Boy. Karagoni also wrote an episode of the 1990 G.I. Joe cartoon. By 1992, Karagoni started up his own comic book packaging company. They would produce comics ready-made for a publisher, with the first project intended to be a rebooted version of 1960s comic Thunder Agents. This put him in touch with Penthouse's publisher, Bob Guccione. After pitching Thunder Agents to Guccione, Guccione countered by hiring Caragoni to create comics for his Penthouse magazine. Caragoni was given an office at Penthouse's headquarters and a massive budget to hire the top talent. Some of the early comics shown in Penthouse magazine in early 1994 included Young Captain Adventure, with art by Adam Hughes, and Scion, illustrated by Kevin Nolan. Caragoni wrote the stories himself. Finally, he had the money to hire his favorite artists and could write all sorts of genres from sci-fi to adventure to superheroes to spy thrillers. The first issue of Penthouse Comics came out in May of 1994 and was 96 color pages for $4.95. With page rates up to $800 a page, Penthouse Comics immediately was able to grab new talents including artists like Dave Johnson and Jason Pearson and also respected creators like Gary Leach and Mark Beecham. Penthouse Comics was also able to get some of the best European artists like Mobius and Milo Minara to work on their title. The comics came out once every two months and featured several recurring stories in an anthology format. Young Captain Adventure featured superstar artist Adam Hughes. It's a parody of superhero comics, especially the grim and gritty 90s books. This page clearly takes a swipe at Rob Liefeld's Youngblood then one of the most popular books. I don't think anyone can argue that Adam Hughes doesn't draw gorgeous, voluptuous women. Scion is a Cold War thriller with a shape-shifting protagonist. Kevin Nolan is respected as an artist's artist and can tackle pretty much anything. His expertise in lighting gives this book the right tone, but it also features masterful storytelling and composition. And look, the title had some straight-up sex stories, but the Hughes and Nolan stories were aiming to work on other levels than just titillation. The title also had a sci-fi story called Bethlehem Steel, and an adventure story set during World War II that blended Captain America and Indiana Jones with a female lead. However, it's worth noting that Dr. Dare had a new artist the following issue, and Bethlehem Steel returned in issue three with a new artist. By issue five, Young Captain Adventure was illustrated by Kevin McGuire of Justice League International fame, and he was soon gone, replaced with lesser known names in the comics field. The less said about the replacement for Kevin Nolan on Scion, the better. Issue 2 also featured a new strip called Pets about a girl rock band with art by Dan DiCarlo, famous for locking in the look for Archie Comics for decades. But that strip didn't last long. Penthouse Comics also had chapters by famous European artists, but they were always a special chapter, nothing ongoing within the pages of Penthouse Comics. Artist turnover was high. The book introduced a lot of upcoming talent, like Jeff Johnson, Jason Pearson, Dave Johnson, Mark Teixeira. It featured pinups by industry veterans like Jim Steranko and Neil Adams. Penthouse Comics even featured a painted cover on issue four by the late, great Frank Frazetta. As comics flooded comic shelves by the mid-90s, Penthouse had Caragoni launch two more titles by April of 1995, Penthouse Men's Adventure Comics and Omni Comics. I strongly suspect that one of the reasons Penthouse Comics had high turnover and eventually collapsed after a few years is because of chaos behind the scenes, disorganization. Uh, again, that's purely speculation. But now we're going to shift to talking about George Caragoni's life behind the scenes, and I think it'll back up my supposition. With three titles at Penthouse, Caragoni must have felt pressure to produce a lot of content but he made some questionable decisions. He fired managing editor Horatio Weisfeld during the production of issue four. 
In June of 1994, Canada threatened to not distribute Issue 2 because of what they said was the subjugation of women and other sexual themes. Caragoni not only kept the book as is, and it resulted in the ban, he then wrote an editorial in Issue 3 ranting about political correctness. Caragoni also had the cover of Issue 3 feature a swastika after Issue 2 removed swastikas and Hitler's face for their European print run. In fact, Penthouse Comics was to a large degree a vanity project. Caragoni had himself drawn as a tough cowboy in Issue 1, and not only wrote almost every comic and contracted his favorite artists, he also included an opinion column. But the pressure got to him. In 1995, Caragoni was working in his office all night long and sleeping all day. Penthouse accused him of embezzlement. According to his friend, comic book writer and historian Mark Evanier, Caragoni was wildly overspending his budget as well as using the funds for other things. Before working for Penthouse, Evanier says Caragoni avoided smoking, drinking, sex, and drugs, but that he soon engaged in all of those rigorously, especially the drugs. On Friday, July 14th of 1995, Caragoni found himself locked out of his office and was told an audit would be performed on his expenses. Throughout the weekend, Evanier and other friends called Caragoni to beg him to slow down and get help. Caragoni went incommunicado for a few days until Thursday, July 20th, when he appeared in the lobby of the Times Square Marriott Marquis Hotel. He asked a bellhop if it was true that this building had the tallest indoor atrium in New York, which the bellhop confirmed. Garagoni went to the top floor and jumped off. He was a large man, over 400 pounds, which came slamming down into the buffet tables at the center of the hotel. Fortunately, no one else was killed, but witnesses, including children, had to see it happen right in front of them. Caragoni was only 29 years old. A co-worker of Caragoni's, one who he had tried to blame for the missing money, had to identify the body. According to Evanier, this trauma stayed with him, and he also later killed himself. Penthouse Comics installed Elliot Brown as the editor and included an in-memoriam credit for Caragoni in issue 9. Some of the material Caragoni had contracted ended up in the magazine after his passing, including early work by Mark Teixeira, and perhaps most notably, a Batman parody comic by French artist Mobius. The man behind seminal work such as Blueberry, Metal Herlant Magazine, The Incal, and many more, had pitched the book to DC, who'd turned it down. It involved a depressed Cape Crusader talking to a therapist who was actually revealed as the villain of the story. But by the time Caragoni was off Penthouse Comics, so were most of the top-name talent, and obviously he wasn't around to continue writing his own stories. The book managed to hang in there until issue 32 in the summer of 1998, when it and its spin-offs were all quietly cancelled. And Penthouse was dealing with a lot of financial problems at the time. The magazine declared bankruptcy a few years later in 2003. Penthouse Comics was still pulling in 50,000 copies an issue when it ended, which were decent sales. But no one was excited about the book anymore. Well, almost no one. For some reason, it was still popular in Spain. Yeah, in Spain, a Spanish publisher actually got the rights to continue Penthouse Comics. They went all the way through 2011, 108 issues altogether. So a much longer run than what we had here in the United States. Uh, but really, only the first several issues are any good. Uh, the first few issues are very unique. You know, some of the best artwork you could find at the time. No question. A lot of the stories are funny. But when you look at the story of Penthouse Comics, it really seems to encapsulate the problems with the 90s speculator boom. It, it shines a harsh light on 90s comics because this stuff was all focused on style. It was focused on big name artists. It was lots of throwing money around at the problems. And ultimately, it just proved to be too much pressure for one man. Tragic story. Thank you so much for following me through this interesting corner of comic book history. 
I promise that when we come back next week, I'll have a really interesting episode that's a lot more fun. Uh, so please, please stick around. We will be back with more content, we being me. <laughs> but thanks so much for joining me. And until next time, keep reading comics. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.